Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church, Grove City, Minnesota. Today we're going to continue on in our look at the book of 1 Peter. If you have your Bible, open up to 1 Peter chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 22 through 25. 1 Peter is in the back half of the New Testament. If you get into Revelation, you've gone too far, go back a couple pages and you should be able to find it. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles open. Now that you have been purified, or now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. The power of the word of God. There are loads of stories online about power of Christ working through the word of the gospel in the lives of people in our country and around the world. You probably know many. Maybe you know people personally whose lives made a dramatic shift. One of the more famous out there is the story of the cross and the switchblade. If some people have read that book, maybe some haven't. The story of Nikki Cruz, a street gang member, and David Wilkerson, the Pentecostal pastor, preaching in the streets of Brooklyn. How a man who had murdered and beaten and lived a life unimaginable in Nikki Cruz was dramatically changed to love the Lord and now preaches the gospel because of the gospel message that David Wilkerson preached. It's a message that should be in all of our lives, right? We all have that time where the Word of God has impacted our lives. Peter today in our passage lays out what it means and how the Word of God can affect our lives. The power of the gospel message. In verse 22, it starts out by saying this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Peter tells us that our souls are purified through obedience to the Word of God. It's a sense of doing, right? When we are obedient, we are purified. It's interesting here that he uses the word by. Because we've talked about the idea of what keeps us from being purified is the fact that we are not obedient to the Father, right? We don't always want to do what the, what the Father, what God wants us to do. So it seems interesting here that Peter is telling us that it's not that purification takes place so that we obey, but also by being obedient that the soul is purified. This may seem like a, a weird contradiction or a stuck in a circle that just keeps going round and round. But when we look at it from the outside, when we take a glimpse outside the box, we can see an amazing work taking place. Obedience on our part feeds purification. Purification feeds into our obedience causing us to be more obedient. So the idea of obedience is not something that we can just see here in 1 Peter. It's an integral part of the New Testament, the, the idea of obedience. In James verse 1, 22, we've been studying James in our community builders Verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Tells us not to just listen, but to be doers of the word. In John 14, 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. 
And in 1 John 2, 17, it says, The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew 7, 24. The Greek word here for obey is uh, hupaku, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong because my Greek is not that great, but that's good enough. If you break that word down, it has two parts. Hupo, which is where we get our English word for hyper. And the second half of that, the aku, which is the verb for hear. When I was a kid, I wasn't given the label hyperactive. I don't think it was around back then quite yet. But I was one of those kids with lots of energy. I was a little more active than most kids and I had a hard time sitting still. And if you watch me preach, I have a hard time standing still behind the pulpit and I move back and forth because of that, right? But that word in Greek literally means Hyper hearing. The idea of ob obeying here is not just letting it enter into our system through our ear canals, right? We just hear it, and that's all the further it goes. You know, sometimes it's in one ear and out the other. But it's something that we should feel all the way to our soul. We should experience the Word of God with every aspect of our body. Feel it, hear it, taste it, smell it. That's what will bring about change in our lives. And what brings about obedience to what God has called us to do. Peter calls for obedience to the truth. Truth is a funny word. It's something that shouldn't constantly change, but in our society today, in our culture... It constantly is changing. Even right now, there's something that is, with this virus, that things are always changing. We, don't, we hear one thing, we hear the other. So we, as a world, struggle to know what is the truth about something as simple as the virus. Our culture struggles with the idea that there could be binding truths that do not change. Because what I feel truth might be, might not be truth to you. And if there was truth in the world, I might have to submit to it or obey it, and that takes me out of control. It goes against our sinful nature to obey. Because let's be honest, if I'm in control, I'm in charge and not someone else or something, and so I don't need anything else. If I know what truth is and I declare what truth is, that's fine, even if it's different than what you declare truth. But that's not the way truth works. See, we're told that with the help of the Holy Spirit, Peter reminds us that this is how the sanctification process takes place. The idea that we are continually maturing and growing in the Lord. That we are more and more obedient to what is real truth. And in that process, obedience leads to purification. And when our bodies are purified more and more, it leads to more obedience to the real truth. All with the help of the Holy Spirit. And that is how we grow in the Lord, and that is how we reach those that are lost. Obedience to the truth leads to purification, but it also leads us to love our brothers. And not just love them, right? Verse 22 says, in the second half of it, the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. Sincere love, deep love from the heart. Truth 
truly loving someone from our heart deep down inside might possibly be one of the hardest things on the face of the earth to do. It's the second greatest commandment, right? In Mark 12, we're going to hop around the Gospels this morning. Verses 28 and 30. The leaders come to Jesus and ask him, what is the greatest commandment? Teachers of the law have come and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is, here, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. No commandment greater than that. But yet we see at the end of this, the leaders kind of scurrying off because Jesus follows with this parable. Luke 10, 29 through 30, it says this, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor then? Right? Because if I'm supposed to love my neighbor, and I know who exactly that is, then I can love that person, but I don't have to love the other people I want to love, or I don't want to have to love. In reply to this, verses 30 through 39, Jesus said this, A man was going down from J Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be coming down the road, the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The experts in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. We see that the priestly, the important people, the Jewish brothers of this man would have, should have stopped and interacted with him and helped him. Instead, they walked to the other side of the street. It was the man who would have been their arch enemy, the Samaritan, the man they looked down on and despised, who comes along and comes alongside this man, takes care of him, helps him, and gets him healed. Showing him what it means to truly love a brother. We read uh, this week for Community Builders, our group, that small group that's going through the book of James about favoritism. How we as humans make snap judgments about people. Right? We can be selfish. We look at people and we think, mm, maybe I shouldn't be friends with them. Or we see somebody else and we think, oh, I gotta be that person's friends. Right? All of these things keep us from truly loving and deeply loving people. P Peter urges the church to love one another because that is the power of the gospel message. It renews, it cleanses, it matures us for life, for a life of love. But like last week when we discussed holiness, this is not something that Peter just wants us to give our best shot, to put a little effort into it, or to say we did our best. I can't just go around church on Sunday or all over town and say, I love you, brother. Blessings on you. I love you, man. We hear it all the time. We tell people that all the time. But Peter tells us this is not an aspect, not just an aspect of our faith. It is a requirement. And it shows the holiness that we talked about last week in the first half of this passage. 
In his book, The Message of First Peter, Edmund Clowney says this, he, talking about Peter, is not satisfied with tolerance or acceptance, far less with formalized distance. But even sincerity is not enough. Our love should be deep and intense. I was on a job site the other night and I came across a sticker on a door and it said, or a little sign someone had taped up and it said, I went to shop at a store the other day and the sign outside said, we'll treat you like family. I'm never shopping there again, it said. And maybe that shows your family how your family is. But for the most part, we love our family deeply, right? We love them with intensity because they are our family. They are our kin. And no matter what kind of crap they pull or the stunts that they do to drive us crazy, we still love them because they're family. Deep and intense. Outside of family, or maybe a spouse or your children, I guess that would be family, when was the last time you loved somebody deeply and with intensity? I know a young man when football season comes around that he loves intensely and deeply a team with the colors in purple and gold. I know another young lady who's probably sitting next to him that loves reading deeply. She just loves it, even if it drives her father crazy sometimes. The word Peter uses in this passage means stretched or strained. It's the same word that is used to describe Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed so intensely there that blood came out of his skin. That's not just a superficial love. This is a love that should draw us together, to bring us together in unity of mind, spirit, and flesh. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians and to the church in Rome, reminds us of the same thing Peter says here. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, I'm going to read verses, verse 9, and then we're going to look at Romans 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 says this. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. This idea that this isn't just something Peter and Paul are talking about or any of the disciples, it's something straight from God, that we need to love our brothers. In 12 verses 9 through 10, Romans 12 verses 9 through 10, it says this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. To love our brothers and sisters in Christ deeply. And there's one single source, or one source of the single thing that Peter points out to as the source of love that should bind us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. The love that the Redeemer showed as he died for you and me is the same love that flows through his redeemed. How is it that we can obey the truth or be purified by the truth, love deeply and intensely? Verse 23 tells us, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. We've been reborn. Born again, made new, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives has taken us from the grave to a spiritual relationship with God that we could have and would not have if we were left to our old selves. It's just not a part of our old nature to seek God and to seek holiness. As much as I would like to think that I played a part in this rebirth, I did not. And nobody else has played a part in their rebirth. 
There is nothing I can do to save me or make me right with God to allow that relationship to play, take place. But once I have been reborn, once I've been born again, I am involved in that continued regeneration, that rebirth. Paul explains that to us in Philippians 2. If you want to turn there with me. Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Peter draws on the same as something as simple as a seed to remind us of the regeneration process. As a kid, we always had a garden, and I understood the process of planting, and a plant comes up, and we would harvest the flowers and sell them to a florist, or we would eat the food that came up, but that was all it was to me. Then I got married, and Sarah uh, helped me understand and took me to a new understanding of seeds and crops and all that kind of stuff. One, because she grew up on a farm, but she also went to school for crop soils, plant management. She taught me all kinds of stuff I never knew. She taught me things like some seeds have to be scored, like a, a notch in them before they'll grow. Some have to be burned. Certain things need fire to release the seeds so that then those plants can be reborn. All kinds of different things like that. It's an interesting world in the plant kingdom. But all seeds... Some part of it has to die for it to regrow. As that seed grows, a part has died and it begins a new life. Ask any farmer out there, he has to go out year after year and plant the seeds because there's no magical corn plant that just keeps producing corn year after year without planting it. Peter points out that we are not born again with perishable seed, seeds of this world. But when God moves in the life of a sinner and the Holy Spirit moves in that seed, it cannot perish. This is a sharp contrast between the life we lived and the life we live now. There's a difference, a change, a rebirth that needs to take place, or that does take place. Peter goes on to emphasize that the word through and the, the word through in the second half of this verse, if you look at it there, it says, For you have been not born or you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. It can also be translated in, in other book by or Passages from, not passages from the Bible, other readings of the Bible, by means of. And Peter shows us that it is not dead things, but it is living and active. Romans 1.16 tells us that the power of God is the gospel message. In Martin Luther's final sermon, he told his people in his parish there to stop looking for the power of God and the secondhand things of the church. See, the people were going on different pilgrimages to holy sites or holy things, hoping that a little bit of that power from those things would rub off on them and that they would find the power of God. Luther called them and challenged them that that was not where the power was. The power was in God's Word. The power is not in the pastor behind the pulpit here. It's not in the elaborateness of the service. But Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
It reminds us of the power of the Word of God. It's a double-edged sword that cuts through joint and marrow. It is a living and powerful Word. Peter ends this passage with one more aspect of the power of the Word of God. Not only is it living and active, but it also endures. Not many things last anymore. They don't endure. One of the best examples of that is old news. It's no good. We get a little shopper or newspaper every week, and I have a stack of them sitting in the house waiting for a fire. I look through the shop ads and Menards or Runnings, and then they go in a pile. But if I was to go back a week later, take one of those ads and go into Runnings or Menards and say, I want this for this price, they're going to laugh at me. It's no good anymore. It doesn't endure. It doesn't do me any good to take that old sale ad back in. They would just look at me and laugh. But not the word of the Lord. It is an abiding word. If you look at books, my daughter loves to read, you can grab something like Homer's Iliad. You could read it, it's a great read. But at some point, the world will forget Homer and what he wrote. It will be gone forever. But not the word of the Lord. It is abiding forever. Verse 24 through 25 says, For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Is this not the life we live, right? We strive to reach the top, only to find that the glory and value that we thought it would bring us only lasts for a moment. And then there's something else to try and reach for, to bring us glory and power, or to bring us that sense of awe. We can try and try. We can get that rush over and over again. That feeling of glory, but it will always fade away. Just like the grass that grows up and withers and dies in the winter. The flowers that are there in the spring and a few weeks later are gone. Peter draws back from Isaiah with that passage when he brings that point to us. But Peter reminds us at the end of verse 25 that the word endures forever. This is the same word that has been preached to you. 2,000 years after Peter wrote these words, we still gather to study, to read this word that endures through all the criticism, the propaganda, the hatred launched against it. The word Word of the Lord is powerful. I want to close with the words of the poet Samuel Valentine Cole. Hammer away, ye hostile hands. Your hammer breaks. God's anvil stands. Let's break.